Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. We're shooting today at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. Uh, I want to remind you, by the way, to join us at Facebook.com. Uh, Facebook.com slash UNC knowledge. Facebook.com forward slash unc knowledge. Dr. Larry P. Arne received his undergraduate degree from Arkansas State University and his master's and doctoral degrees, both in government, from the Claremont Graduate School. He has also studied at the London School of Economics and at Worcester College, Oxford. He is a founder and past president of the Claremont Institute. Since 2000, Dr. Arne has served as the 12th president of this institution, Hillsdale College, and has still found time to write and teach on our topics today, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And our time is limited because you've got to go off and teach the fifth book of Aristotle's Ethics. Is that correct? Correct. Ordinarily, I welcome people to Uncommon Knowledge, but this is your campus, so uh, <laughs> you, you welcome me, Larry. You, you are warmly welcome. Oh, thank you, Larry. Segment one, what the founders gave us. I'm quoting you. You can read the Declaration and the Constitution in a few minutes. They're simple, they're beautiful, they can be understood and retained. Place the documents in their historical context. Why did they matter at the time? Well, they're very, uh, there's never been anything like them in history. There still is nothing like them. But remember the king of England, who was a nice man, by the way, and a, and a humble man for a king, <laughs> was referred to by the title majesty. And it took the founders, a lot of them, for a long time thought, the only way you can have stability is if some family is appointed to rule. And so the king, the king was a very humble man, but when his son wanted to marry somebody, a noble, but of lower station than, than, than the king's family, he said, princes may not marry subjects, ever, no matter what your heart says. So the point is, that's the world, mm -hmm. right? That's what's known. And that, that's the first incredible thing about the Declaration of Independence. There are three. The second incredible thing about the Declaration of Independence is in the last sentence. The Declaration of Independence was written by people for whom the military was looking. General Gage had an order, and the order said, find these people, even if it means complete war, detain them. In other words, they were guilty of treason. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to put their name on a document and send it to the king. And they write in the last sentence, in the mood that somebody who was about to do that would write, in support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's how people talk on a battlefield. They die for each other. We mutually pledge to each other. That's the second extraordinary thing. And then mm -hmm. the third becomes more amazing because of the first two. The opening of the Declaration of Independence has nothing to do with them. In fact, it demotes them. It's not our unique situation. It's not us, a special people, here to do a grand deed. It, uh, it begins universally and abstractly. When in the course of human events means any old time, mm -hmm. it becomes necessary for one people means any old people to dissolve the political bands that have connected with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. It's an act of obedience to a law that persists beyond the English law and beyond any law that they might make. So for them to be the particular people whose lives are at risk, and for them to be turning over an entire way of organizing society that had dominated for 2,000 years, and then for them to begin that way, it's very grand, but also you can't miss it, it's partly humble. Mm. It's, it's, we, the, these are the ways that people must comport themselves. We are going to do that. And if you will do that, British, we will get on. And if not, we will not. And we will be in the right because of that. So that's what's remarkable about it and why it's very beautiful, the Declaration. And it connects to the Constitution. You have to first know that modern scholarship claims, and you know, Gordon Wood and Joseph Ellis and famous people, excellent scholars claim that there were two foundings, mm -hmm. one for the Declaration of Independence and one for the Constitution. And they mean different things, is the claim. And, and by the way, that's a, that's a very powerful thing 
because if it's true that they changed their mind right in the middle of the revolution, their example to us might be we can change our mind whenever we want to. Mm -hmm. But the Constitution doesn't read that way. The Constitution has three grand things in it, and they're very lovely, and they are all commanded in the Declaration of Independence. The first is that government be limited uh, in the Declaration. And it's limited in obvious ways, right? Mm -hmm. There's, it's a doctrine of enumerated powers in the mm -hmm. Constitution. There's a list of things that the Congress can do in the Constitution. And the other things that it, it's not listed, they, it may not do. And you'd think that's some uh, change from the Declaration, but the, in the Declaration, uh, the middle part of the Declaration of Independence is the charges against the king. Right. And if you want to understand American constitutionalism, its basis, read those. Because the things that the king has done justify the revolution, and they amount to violations of constitutionalism. So he has sent swarms of officials among us to eat out our substance and harass our people. He has uh, brought troops from a foreign jurisdiction. He has, uh, so in other words, it's a breach of limited government. Mm -hmm. But once you have limited government, you have a vast, big society that's independent, and you can locate sovereignty in it. Now, James Madison takes pride in the 63rd Federalist that this is the first form of government in which the sovereign does not operate any part of the government. It is a, and this is the second principle, mm -hmm. it is a representative form of government. It is limited, and because it's limited, it's possible for it to be representative. And what that means is, in the government, nothing will operate except that it gets its authority from outside. But since everybody's human who's going to get governed, then you don't want the people outside to be of unlimited power either. And so they can only act through the government. They can't act directly. They can talk and talk and talk and argue and argue and argue, just like we are right now. Mm -hmm. Just like you did beautifully last night in your speech about Reagan. But we have to wait for elections to do anything. That makes us more deliberative. The charges against the king in the Declaration of Independence are full of a list of where the king, the executive branch, has messed with the legislatures and the judges and disrupted representative institutions.